applause. Would, if you're a mom, would you stand, please? Look at them. Aren't they beautiful? I think we could do better than that. Let's give these ladies a round of applause. Amen. God is so good. We thank God for you, and we thank God for every woman. Not just moms, but we thank God for women. We better thank God for them. None of us would be here without them. We are so blessed today to honor the, the wonderful contribution that mothers make. Oftentimes, they don't get the credit that they deserve. But I believe that every mother is a good mother and desires to be the very best that they can be for their children. And it is, it is just a refreshing to be here with you this morning. We had a wonderful week away at District Council. The pastors and us, we had an opportunity to be down at Ocean City with all of the pastors of New Jersey for about a three-day conference. And you know what was so refreshing was that the Spirit of God met us in our meetings. And they weren't just meetings of business, although we did conduct business, but the Spirit of God was just so evident. And that's encouraging to me as a pastor that there is a genuine hunger in our Assemblies of God churches here in New Jersey that they are desirous for the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And we had a beautiful time in His presence, and we're so delighted. And I, I bring you greetings, and I, I thank you for many of you who prayed for us in our time away. We were so refreshed. And I just want that today, as you may be visiting with us for the first time, that you would sense here in this service today the presence of the Lord. Because there's one thing that we desire here is, is that we don't just have church. But that when we, the church, the people gather together, that the presence of God would be evident here. That you would go away from here knowing that surely the presence of the Lord was here. And so it's important to have structure, but this is important for us to welcome and to have opportunity for the Spirit of God today. And I'm so delighted that you are here. I believe that God will encourage us through His Word this morning. I've, I've entitled my message, Reaching for Your Potential. Reaching for Your Potential. And as we've already noted today, all across America, they will be celebrating Mom's Day, Mother's Day, and no mother here or anywhere is perfect. We may think of them as perfect, but motherhood is not an easy job by any stretch of the imagination. Amen? But as our culture and as our world is spinning faster and faster as it appears almost out of control, the family as a unit is paying a tremendous price. Yet, I am so thankful that the Word of God, the Bible, uplifts the family, and it uplifts womanhood and mothers, and it brings significance to the role that women play, unlike any other religion on the face of the earth. The Bible honors women and recognizes their significant contribution to us, and I'm thankful for that because the, the, the motherhood, the, 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 the moms that, that have children, it is a ministry. Motherhood is a ministry. Isn't that right, moms? It's an important ministry, and sometimes it's often overlooked. A ministry of caring, a ministry of preparing, a ministry of teaching, but perhaps the most and greatest example, motherhood, is an example of the love of God, the love of Jesus Christ. Abraham Lincoln said, I regard no man as poor who has a godly mother. And if you have a godly mother, give thanks to God this morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. And this is going to be somewhat of an unusual uh, revelation perhaps for some people here today as we look at what is known in the Bible as the Hall of Faith. The Hall of Faith. This is a special chapter that has been designated as the chapter of faith in which the great Men and women, the patriarchs of the movement of God, beginning with Father Abraham, the father of the Hebrew people, all the way down through the ages, 
that these men and women who live by faith, and faith is simply a sure confidence, a confident conviction that God is who He says He is. Amen? And that we are under identifying as people of faith. Faith is an important characteristic of every child of God. And as you're turning there to Hebrews chapter 11, I want to define the word potential. Potential. In the... Uh, the dictionary potential as an adjective describes for us something that is possible as opposed to something that is actual. The word potential means capable of becoming. How many of you know we're all becoming a brand new creation in Christ Jesus? From the very day in which we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have been transformed, hallelujah, by the power of God. We're not who we used to be, amen? We're not who we used to be anymore. But we're tr being transformed by His glory day by day. And when we think about the word potential, I don't know how many of you have thought about this, but there is the original meaning, the word, if you look at the word potential, P-E-P-O-T-E-N-T, is the word potent. What does the word potent mean? It means powerful and mighty. If we are going to reach our potential, we need to understand that God has something that is greater in store for us than what we have yet realized. If you and I are on this journey called faith, we should be growing in our potential because God has something greater that is mighty and more powerful than what we've come to realize at this moment. How many of you are thankful for that? You've often heard it preached from this pulpit. I believe that the best days of our church and the best days of our lives are not the ones behind us. I believe that if we understand what our God-given potential is, the best days of our lives are the ones that are yet to come. And I believe that there are reasons for us in life that sometimes people do not reach their full potential. And in particular, I believe that sometimes there are particular lies that the enemy has spoken and he has lied to a generation that would rob them of becoming their full potential and all that they could be for Jesus Christ. But I'm thankful for the word of God. One of the great deceptions of the enemy is to get us to believe in the lie one of the great lies that he told in the beginning. You know, the very language of the devil is one of deception. He's a deceiver. And when the devil speaks, he speaks of duplicity. He's, he's a trickster. He's a schemer. He's a flim-flam and a hoax. He is always out to get somebody. The Bible says he's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so what are some of the particular lies that the devil uses that robs people from reaching their full potential is this. Sometimes we believe in the lie of the enemy that tells us that the, that the greater things that God has for us will be done by someone that is different than us. Sometimes we believe that the things of God are too distant, that they're somewhere far away from us, or that those, those greater things that God has for us will be done because of somewhere different than where we are at the present moment. Some of us don't like where we are at this moment in our lives, and therefore we think that God will not use us or God cannot use the gifts and the abilities that we have, but this is a lie from the enemy. The enemy lies to us, and we need to be aware of the enemy's lie this morning, and we need to reject the lie of the enemy, because how many of you know that the Bible says in Proverbs 1, 7, by the wisest man that ever lived, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools reject wisdom and instruction. It's not uncommon that we as Christians will have difficulties. That's why 1 Peter 4, 12 tells us, in life, Think it not strange, though the fiery trial that has come to try you, as though something out of the ordinary has happened to you. We've all been tried in life, amen? We're either in a, in a trial or headed into one, or we're coming out of one. We will face trials and struggles and limitations. And when we face those failures, and when we are in those trials, 
Those are the moments that we are most vulnerable to the enemy's attacks and the enemy's lies. So we're not going to be ignorant of the enemy's lies this morning. We're going to expose the enemy for who he really is. But I want to look at two people this morning that I believe are amazing characters in the Word of God. Out of the entire book of Hebrews, it says this in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen, which are not made of things which are visible. The Bible goes on to say down in verse 6, Without faith it is impossible to please God, for he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We read here in Hebrews chapter 11, starting at verse 8, we read about Father Abraham. But did you know that in the hall of faith, there are only two women that are actually mentioned by name? And I want to look at those two women this morning as we look at reaching for our full potential. And I want to consider the first one, if you skip down to verse 11, what does it say? It says, by faith, Sarah... The wife of Abraham also received strength to conceive seed. But this was no ordinary child that, that Sarah conceived. For the Bible goes on to tell us that she bore a child when she was past the age that women should bear children. Sarah was in her 90s when she conceived. How many of you know that's a miracle of God? Some of your mother, mothers out there are saying, thank God I'm not 90, right? Can you imagine being 90 years old and running after your child and having the energy to raise a child? But it was by faith. The Bible says that when Sarah was past the age of bearing children, that she conceived and she bore what the Bible tells us was the seed of promise who was none other than Isaac. The very promise seed that God said to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12, that of all the people on the face of the earth, I'm going to bless you with an inheritance, Abraham. When you look up at the sky at night, Abraham, your descendants are going to be more than the stars that you can count in the sky. But how many of you know that there are trials in our lives in that waiting journey for Sarah to bear that child that there was a long period of waiting that followed after. And often that is the way for us in the, in the realm of faith that God has a time and God has a season that operates different than our own. But when God makes a promise, this is what I want you to know this morning. It doesn't matter how long the delay may be in your life or in your situation today. It doesn't matter how long you've been waiting for a particular answer to prayer. God in His promises, God is not a man that He should lie. That's what the Bible tells us. And so when Sarah was past the age of bearing children, she brought forth a son. Because God is a God who is true to his word this morning. And so when we look at Sarah, we see a great woman, a woman of strength, a woman who was the, the matriarch to an entire race, the Hebrew people. And it was through Sarah that God would bring the blessing of the seed that would eventually lead us to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Sarah is a tremendously remarkable woman. But who is the second woman in Hebrews? You might have to go down a few more verses to get to verse 31. Verse 31 tells us in Hebrews chapter 11. By, or let's go back to verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. Verse 31 says, by faith, the harlot Rahab. Uh-oh, that's in the Bible? Some of you don't know what the word harlot is. That's translated prostitute. See, some of us don't think that the Bible is a real book that speaks about real people, but it is a real book that speaks about real people. And you may not be surprised or you may be surprised to find that in the hallmark of faith, there is another type of woman that is mentioned quite in contrast 
much different than Sarah was, but nonetheless important for us in the story of faith to consider. For the Bible says in verse 31, By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe, but when she had received the spies with peace. Remarkable. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to speak of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and also David and Samuel and the prophet. Verse 35 says that women received the dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not <coughs> excuse me, accepting deliverance that they may obtain a better resurrection. So the very first lie that the enemy sometimes speaks in our lives is that we compare ourselves and believing that God would do things for us if things were different. How many, sometimes we look at somebody else's life and we may wish to be like who they are. Or we may say something like the fact that God could never use me because I'm not like so and so. And when you put these two women together, it's remarkable as we look at this, humanly speaking, you could not find a pair that was more different than Sarah and Rahab. You see, number one this morning, the first step in reaching your full potential is to understand what God chooses. God uses the ordinary to do the extraordinary. Would you say that with me this morning? God uses the ordinary to do the extraordinary. So that means that God does not discount you. Tell your neighbor, God did not discount you. Who is he talking to on the other side of your, the other neighbor? He's talking to you. Go on, tell your neighbor. He's talking to you. How many times in our lives have we felt as though we were just ordinary? How many times did we, we, we downplay the fact that what the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.17, that you're what? A new creation in Christ Jesus where old things have passed away and all things become new. You're a new creation in Christ. How many of you are thankful that you're not who you used to be? Praise God. How many times have we been reminded that every Christian has a past, but every saint of God has a future? It's because of the grace of God and the mercy of God that we see that God chooses not like men choose. For God can use even the ordinary to do the extraordinary. And as we look at, at, at the story of Rahab, you can turn with me back to Joshua chapter 2. And this is the one who inherited the promise from Moses. We remember the story how God had led the people out of Egypt and out of bondage. And through the work of the servant Moses, he had led them through the, the great wilderness and he had led them through the Red Sea. And 40 years had passed because there was a generation who did not believe in the promises of God. And they didn't go in to possess the land, but God raised up Joshua. How many of you are thankful that there's a Joshua who reminds us of Yeshua, our Messiah? Praise God. And so when we look at the story of Joshua, turn with me to Joshua chapter 2 this morning as we look at this tremendous story about this woman Rahab. Verse 1, it says, Now Joshua the son of Nun sent out two men from the Acacia Grove to spy out secretly, saying, Go and view the land, especially Jericho. Now Joshua was a very smart general because he knew that if he could conquer the city of Jericho, archaeologists tell us that it was a great city. It was a double-walled city. It was a greatly fortified city. And Joshua knew that if he could conquer Jericho, he could cut the, the, the Holy Land into two parts because he knew that the, the, the kingdoms in the south were weaker. And if he could cut off the fortified city of Jericho, it would be easier to divide and conquer. How many of you know that's the plan that the enemy uses against us, to divide and conquer? So Joshua was using a strategy that was well known in warfare. And so Jericho was a strategic stronghold that needed to be taken. Verse 2 says, And it was told to the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, listen to what they heard. Behold, the men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out this country. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men that have come to you, who have entered into your house, for they have come to search out all of the country. Verse 4 says, The woman took the two men and she hid them. So she said, Yes, the 
The men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. Verse 5, and it happened that as the gate was being shut, when it was dark, that the men went out. And where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you can overtake them. Verse 6 says, but she brought them up to the roof, and she hid them in the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. And you may wonder why they did this, but they just had completed the harvest And it was a time of year when the swelling of the Jordan was at its maximum. And so this was no small undertaking that these spies had to swim across the Jordan River. They got into the city and they find this this harlot Rahab. And there she hides them in her home up on the roof and she covers them with the stalks that she had laid out to dry. Verse 7 says, And then the men pursued them on the road to Jordan to the forts. And as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. Now verse 8 says, Before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, Now listen to what this woman says. I know that who? The Lord has given you the land. This terror of you has fallen upon us. This is the testimony that they had. The enemy was in fear of what they had heard about what great Jehovah had done for the people of Israel. Fear had come upon them. They heard about how God had caused the sea to be divided. It goes on to say, For we have heard how he dried up the Red Sea before you when he came out of Egypt, and what what you had done to the kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, from whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, look what verse 11 says, our hearts melted. How many of you know when you serve the Lord... He's able to take care of us. When you and God stand together, how many of you know you make up the majority? It doesn't matter what walled cities may be in front of you. It doesn't matter the difficulties that may seem impossible. When God is for you, the Bible says, who can stand against you? And this was the testimony that was already working up inside of the hearts of the enemy. They became afraid. Verse 11 says, as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage because of you. For the Lord your God. It is God in you. Hallelujah. The God of glory. Hallelujah. That is the God that is to be feared. Hallelujah. He is the one that is greater and more mighty than any other power on the face of the earth. Verse 12 says, I beg you that you would swear with me by the Lord, since I have shown you this kindness, that you will also show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token and spare my father and my mother and my brothers and my sister and deliver our lives from death. And verse 14 says, the men answered her, our lives are yours if you tell no one our business. And it shall be when the Lord has given us this land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. And they go on to say, if you deal falsely with us, this covenant will be broken. But this will be the sign, Rahab. She lowered them down by a cord through a window so that they could escape. And the sign over Rahab would be this, that she would hang in the window, the Bible tells us, a scarlet cord. Hallelujah. And that scarlet cord would be a symbol that when the the enemy saw the children of of God marching against the city, that she and her household would be saved. This is a biblical uh, symbolic message of the cross of Jesus Christ. This is no other than that scarlet cord, the cord of redemption that we just celebrated two weeks ago. How many of you know that Passover was just celebrated several weeks ago? And it's important for us to make that connection that the Passover was an important demonstration of what Christ would do for his church, that he would be the final lamb that would offer his, himself and that through his blood that we would be saved. And that scarlet cord is a cord that reminds us of the grace of God and of God's great redemption. You see, you may look at your circumstance like a Rahab or like a Rachel. You may compare yourself and you may say, I could never be like her. But God, because of the redemption, just as he said to those Israelites on the first Passover, when I see the blood, hallelujah, 
And it is through faith that we appropriate the blood of Jesus in our hearts. When God still sees the blood, how many of you know that the vilest sinner can be cleansed from their sins? And we lose our guilty stains. This is not only the story of Rahab, this is the story of you and me. You know, as you research this and you go into it a little bit deeper, the translators here in the book of Joshua, in the ancient Hebrew, the word harlot can also be denoted as an innkeeper. But it's interesting as you study this in James, the book of James, there's another mention of of Rahab. And I'm going to turn to James real quickly. And I want to read for you. Because the Bible translators, when they translated it in the New Testament, they used a different word. And this is truly amazing when we come and compare this here. Now, in verse 23, it says of James chapter 2, And the scripture was fulfilled that Abraham believed God. He's the father of our faith, Father Abraham. And it was accounted to Abraham because he believed for righteousness. And Abraham was called a friend of God. Verse 24 says, And when you see this man is justified, he says, You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Verse 25 says, Likewise, was it not Rahab the harlot that was also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? The word is translated there, prostitute. And we read once more about Rahab in Matthew chapter 1 in verse 5. And this is the amazing story of God's grace. Grace is truly amazing, is it not? How many are thankful for God's amazing grace? I know it's only by God's grace that we are standing here this morning. It's God's grace that he can love the vilest of sinners. It's because of God's grace. How many of you are thankful you don't get what you deserve? That's God's grace. But when we read in Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, there's a person that is mentioned in Matthew chapter 5, or Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5, that Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. You see, this woman called Rahab, even though she had a past, God could cancel out that past. God could change her heart. God could not only change her heart, but God changed her destiny. And God changed her life. You see, how many of you know that when you came to faith in Christ, you became a part of something greater than yourself. You became a part of the family of God. And Rahab became a part of the family of God even physically because she was then received, as we read in Joshua chapter 6, that when the Israelites came against them, the scarlet cord was lowered from the window and Rahab and her family was saved. Just like you and I are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ has saved us and protected us. And not only did it protect Rahab, but the Bible says her entire household was also saved. And when we read this story in in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5, this is the very lineage of Jesus Christ that Rahab, how many of you remember the story of Ruth? That Rahab married this prince of Judah named Salmon and they begat a boy and his name was Boaz. And who is Boaz? Boaz is the one who is the kinsman redeemer who married Ruth. And Boaz and Ruth had a son and his name was Obed. And Obed was the father of David, King David. And we see in this story, if God has room in his genealogy for someone who has a past that may be different than yours, how many of you know you're in good company? Praise the Lord. This is truly God's amazing grace. So what do these two women have in common? Both women exercise saving faith in the true and the living God. Your first step in reaching your potential is to understand that God can use the ordinary to do the extraordinary, and he does so when we put our faith in God. Can you thank God for that this morning? It took us a while to get there, but you're seeing the picture, aren't you? Turn with me this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, for God brings it crystal clear for us 
in a special way. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, whom God chooses. And I'm so thankful for this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26, it reads, For you see your calling, brethren, whom God has chosen. Not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen who? Who's foolish? God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame those things that are mighty. And the base things of this world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to... Th to bring to nothing the things that are so that no flesh could glory in his presence. I like how the message puts this in its translation. It says this, take a good look, friends, at who you were when you got called into this Christian life. I don't see many of the brightest and the best among you, not many influential, not many from high society families. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose us, men and women, that the culture overlooks exploits and abuses God chose these nobodies to expose how hollow the pretensions of the somebodies how many of you are thankful the world may think you're a nobody but to God you're a somebody hallelujah I'm thankful that Jesus in Luke 7 verse 34 was even willing to be called a friend of sinners but there's even something more that's amazing to this amazing grace, a grace that is greater than all our sin, is that this scarlet cord that we read here is the very scarlet cord that reminds us of our story of redemption from Genesis 3, 15, all the way through John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that, the, that whosoever should believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. We serve an amazing God. The Bible is an amazing story, a story that God shows time and time again, even though the enemy whispers us and reminds us of our past, we can remind the enemy of his future today. Amen? Because greater is he that is in us, the Bible says, than he that is in the world. There's one more woman that I want to look at this morning, and her story is found in 1 Kings chapter 17. And we're going to turn there quickly because I believe that many of us could relate to this woman's situation, maybe not in a physical sense, but in an emotional sense or even in a spiritual sense. There was a great prophet by the name of Elijah, one of the great prophets of God that we know the story of Elijah perhaps the best when Elijah called fire down from heaven. But there was a wicked king by the name of Ahab who did much evil in the sight of the Lord and provoked Israel, the Bible says, to sin against Jehovah. And because of their idolatry, placing other gods in place of Jehovah, God said to Elijah, go and pronounce judgment and pronounce a drought that would be upon the land. And it's important to know that this was a serious business because if there was no rain from heaven for three years... They had no Walmart to go to. They had no freezer to pull food out of. Everything that they subsisted on was grown from the ground. And if there was no rain from heaven, there would be no crops. And if you don't have a crop in the first year, you have no seed to plant in the second year. A drought that would last for three years was a serious business. And we read here that after Elijah pronounces this judgment, God tells him to go down to the brook called Cherith. And there God would supply him his daily bread by the ravens and he would have water to drink. But it says here in verse 7 of 1 Kings chapter 17, And it happened. Everybody say that. And it happened. <laughs> There's going to be a happening that will come in your life. There's going to come a moment that it's going to happen. Something is going to happen, and it may not seem good at first. And it happened after a while, the brook dried up. Because there had been no rain in the land. Verse 8, God sends a word, 
the word of the Lord comes to him in verse 8, and he tells him, Go down to Zarephath, which belongs inside, and, and dwell there. I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Isn't this like God? Sometimes we can't figure God out. Sometimes our lives go from bad to worse before they ever get better. And Elijah is commanded to go to this place of Zarephath, and there a widow is going to provide for him. So verse 10, he goes to Zarephath, and when he comes to the city, he finds a widow who is gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, please bring me a little water in a cup. How many of you know that that water was costly? But the woman relented, and she brought him something to drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and also said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And so she said, look at verse 12, As the Lord lives, I do not have any bread, only flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. See, I'm gathering a couple sticks that I may go and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Her situation was something that was doubtful, it was not looking very good for her. It looked like this was the end of the rope. And it shows again for us the mercies of God that of all the people that were probably also suffering at that time, the compassions of the Lord, they fail not, the Bible says. They are new every morning. How our Father cares even for a lonely widow, the Bible doesn't even mention by name, but God said to the prophet, go there. I'm going to make a way for you, and I'm going to make a way for her. You know, we can relate to her story. Many of us can relate to her story because the hope that we once had may seem now a distant hope. It may seem like all hope is gone, as it seemed for her, because listen to her words. I'm going to prepare this food, we're going to eat it, and then there's nothing left. How many of you know when there's no more food, there's no more food? What does Elijah say? Verse 13. Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but first. You see, this is the step of faith. First, make me a small cake and bring it to me, and afterward, make some for yourself and your son. You see, the enemy can discount us and make us think that God cannot use us, but God sees something that men do not see. What did God see in this widow's hand is something that speaks faith, I believe, into every person's heart here today. If you want God to use you, God can use you. He says, look what I've given you into your hands. You see, sometimes we look at our situation and we compare ourselves with other, those who are different with us. But this woman, God is saying, look what I've put into your hands. And so she did. She acted in faith. And I believe that God is wanting in this hour and this generation a people of faith that their faith will have hands and feet. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Your faith is not just in your head. Your faith is not just in your heart. Your faith is where you live every day of your life. And so this woman was put to the test and she was put to the test and Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you have said. Or verse 14 goes on, for thus says the Lord God of Israel. How many of you know when you get a thus saith the Lord, you can stand on that? For thus says the Lord of Israel, the bin of flour will not be used up, nor the jar of oil run dry until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. So she went away and she did according to the word of Elijah. And she and her household, what does it say? They ate for many days. How many of you know God can do the impossible? How many of you today still believe that God works in miracles in our lives? How many of you still believe in our church today that God is a miracle worker? You see, everybody wants a miracle, but no one wants to be in a position that requires one. I get it. But this woman... She acted in faith. She took what she had and she did something with it. I believe that perhaps we are overlooking the fact that what has God put into your hand? Has God given you the ministry of helps? Are you using that ministry? 
What has God put into your hands? Has God put an ability or a talent in your life? And are you using it for God's glory and for his kingdom purposes? You see, sometimes we discount what God is doing because we are forgetting that God is a God of all possibilities. He's looking for our availability. And this woman acted in faith. And that's what is required for us to reach our full potential is that we must take a first step. And that widow took a step. She lived in extremely difficult lives. She seemed to have a disadvantaged life because, you know, as a widow, there wasn't much hope in Israel for widows. They didn't have the means. There was no social security. There was no Medicare. And there was no food stamps. If you were a widow, you, requ- you were required to glean from the fields of the farmers. The law commanded the farmers not to glean everything, not to take all of the harvest. To be a widow meant that you were very poor and you were lived of very humble means. And so for there to be a drought, it would severely have affected this woman's means of survival. But God can make a way when there seems to be no way. Hallelujah. Because the Bible told us in 1 Corinthians 1.26, God has not chosen the mighty. God has not chosen the noble. God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound those things that are mighty. Because how many of you know that you and God make up the majority? And with God, all things are possible. I'm so thankful for this story because it speaks faith into our lives where we live today. And so this reminds us of the important thing is to let's look at taking a step with where you're at. For those of us who want to believe God for greater things, what step, what next step may God be asking you to take in your walk of faith with Him? Does God want you to go somewhere? Does God want you to minister to someone? Does God want you to do something that you never dreamed possible of doing? If he has, listen to his word and stand upon it because God can make a way where there seems to be no way. And oftentimes in our lives, I think many Christians get discouraged because you would say, well, that's a wonderful end of the story, but that's not the end of the story. For not only did they eat of many days, but the Bible goes on to say in 1 Kings 17, 17, and quickly, now it happened when those things happened that the son of the woman who who owned the house became sick. And the sickness was serious to the point that the young man died. Now we may look at this story and say, well, God, this seems to be unfair. This seems to almost be cruel. This widow had already suffered the loss of her husband, and now you would take her very last gift, the reason for her living, her son. And you know, the Elijah said to her, What have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come? Listen to me. Sometimes we think and we were reminded that the enemy comes at those moments of vulnerability. Listen to what the widow said. Have you come to to remind me of my sin? And to kill my son. And Elijah said to her, give me your son. And he took him out of her arms and he carried him to the upper room where he was staying and he laid him on his bed. And then the Bible says in verse 20, he cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you also brought tragedy on this widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? You see, sometimes we face circumstances and situations that are beyond us. How many of you know this widow had no hope at that moment when her son was taken from her? And how many of you know that when you're dead, you're really dead? The problem with dead people is they don't come back to life unless God does a miracle. But that's who Elijah remembers us, reminds us that with God all things are possible. And sometimes God will bring us to situations in life that seem hopeless and beyond our control. And it's there that God is setting us up for the greatest miracle of all. And that is the resurrection and the life that points to Jesus Christ. Though you were dead, yet shall you live again. That is what Jesus Christ has done for us. He is the resurrection and the life. And God did a miracle because there as Elijah prayed, breath, the Bible says, came back into the boy and he woke up. The dead come alive when God comes and shows up on the scene. And see, sometimes our hope may seem distant, 
But in the distance of our hope, there is faith. And when you have faith, the Bible wants to encourage us, hold on to your faith because God, the God of all possibilities, is going to come through in a powerful way. When our one who is greater than Elijah, Jesus, comes, how many of you know the dead will come to life because they will hear his voice and they will respond? Praise God. And so we're reminded here today that we serve a God of great possibilities. He's a God who is above the natural. We serve a supernatural God. And so if we want to reach for our full potential, it begins with taking the first step, the step of faith, which means placing our trust in Jesus Christ. And as we turn here this morning to conclusion, I want to turn to Psalm 145. And would you stand with me this morning? The Lord is gracious. The Bible says in Psalm 145 and verse 8, The Lord is gracious. Can we say that together? The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Slow to anger and great in mercy. Verse 9 says, The Lord is good to all. And His tender mercies are over all his works. Praise God. Verse 10 says, and I'll just read on, All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you, for they shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power, to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and his glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. Verse 14 tells us, The Lord upholds everyone who falls, and He raises up those who are bowed down, the eyes of all who look expectantly to you, and He gives them, almost just like what we read here in this passage, He gives them food in their season. Verse 16 says, You open your hand, and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all His ways, and He is gracious in all His works. And before we conclude today, I want to everyone who may be a guest and visitor with us today, I want you to know that the Lord is near to those who call upon Him. To everyone, the Bible says, who calls to Him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who put their trust in Him. He will hear their cry and He will save them. Isn't that beautiful? The Lord preserves all who love Him. The Lord preserves all who love Him, but the wicked He will destroy. My mouth will speak of the praise of the Lord and all flesh shall bless His holy name. Bless the Lord this morning, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. There's a promise for us today as we conclude here. There's a promise to reach our full potential means that we not only need to take the first step of faith, but every day we must walk by faith. And how do we walk in faith? In trust with the Lord, arm in arm and hand to hand. And I'm going to encourage you today that if you've never taken that step of faith, Today is a good day to take that step and place your trust in Him. Would you bow your, bow your heads with me for a moment? Father, the enemy is a liar and he's a father of lies. He's been discouraging and doing everything in his power to distract us from our true mission, our true calling. As God's children, we are called to place our trust in Him at all times. There are some today who may be looking at their circumstance or their situation and the enemy is reminding them how different things are. And because of those differences, they don't feel that they could ever measure up to God's love and mercy. But God, you've shown us just the opposite today that you displayed your mercy and your love by sending Jesus Christ into this world to die for our sins 
so that through him we might have faith and through him we may have hope that is eternal. It is because of Jesus' work on the cross that we have the forgiveness of our sins and the purchase of his blood has purchased for us our redemption. And the guilty can lose their guilty stains. Father, I pray today that those here in the sound of my voice who have never put their faith and trust in you, that today, God, you stand and you knock at the door of their hearts. You ask, O oh God, to come in and to make your dwelling among them. You come in, Lord, to, to make all things new. Lord, you come to transform us from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of light. God, we thank you for the transformation that takes place when true saving faith comes. It changes everything. It changed our lives. It changed us for eternity, oh God. And if you're here today and you've never taken that step, it would be my privilege to pray with you as I would pray for everyone in this concluding service today. And you would say, I've never put my faith in Christ, but I want to put my faith in Christ. If that is you today, would you just raise your hand? I'd like to pray with you. Praise God. Is there anyone else here today that would say, please remember me in this prayer? I want to place my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Is there someone else? God loves you with an everlasting love. And God accepts you just the way that you are. You don't have to do anything to change who you are. You just have to come to him as you are. Is there someone else here today that would say, yes, pastor, remember me in this concluding prayer that I want to put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Is there someone else? Praise God. So I'm going to ask those of us who raise their hands and all of us to pray together a simple prayer. I can only simply introduce you, but you have to believe these words with your own heart. And so if you would please repeat after me, Dear Jesus, I come to you as a sinner and I recognize my need for your forgiveness. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me and wash me in your blood. Make me a new creation in Christ Jesus. Fill me with the hope of your return. Teach me your ways that I may walk in your truth all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Give the Lord a clap of praise this morning.